Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, the 2000, 2021 Connecticut Mentoring Summit session entitled Unleashing the Power of Data Program Evaluation for Mentoring Providers. Uh, we are happy to have you here today. My name is Joe Hawk. I am the program manager at the Governor's Prevention Partnership, and I'm going to moderate our session today. Before we start, I want to uh, talk about a few housekeeping uh, points. First of all, uh, the session is 45 minutes long. We have three presenters, so uh, we will be uh, doing our best to stay on target for the 45 minutes. There will be a question and answer session at the end. We are recording the webinar or the session today for future distribution. And that information when it's available will be made uh, available to all red people who have registered and we will send you more information as they become available. We have a disclaimer here. Uh, the views expressed in the presentation are the views of, of the, par the presenters and not of the Governor's Prevention Partnership. The information is provided for solely educational purposes and the Governor's Prevention Partnership is not liable for any outcomes related to the implementation of the materials presented here today. So we have three featured speakers. speakers. First, I'm going to give a very brief introduction. Then we will have Ann McIntyre Lawner, who is the founder of Action to Outcomes and an author who has written a couple books on, on data use that is for um, providers of services. And Damian Grasso, who is an associate professor in the Department of uh, psychiatry at the University of Connecticut Health Center uh, and runs a, a fantastic mentoring program. So he's going to share some information about his use of data for his program. So I want to start out by just talking about very, very briefly, because I want to leave enough time for Anne and Damien to really get into what their uh, planning to speak to today, but I want to talk about some key components, okay? I've been doing research and evaluation on services for adolescents for a couple decades now, and I've worked with a lot of providers, and one of the things that I notice is a lot of times providers and program people are afraid of data. They're afraid of evaluation. They forget that data and evaluation is power. It informs the program staff about what's working, what's wasting their time, how they can expand their program, how they can use the data on how good their programming is to try and get more funding. So there's no real reason uh, to be afraid of data, although it's understandable that um, you know sometimes people feel that they're they're somehow getting a report card grade on how good their service is, instead of realizing that that information feeds back into to, um, making their service what they want it to be, and that's the best for the young people that they're serving. There is a large body of literature and a couple really good studies of studies or meta-analysis on the effectiveness of mentoring. And what it shows is some mixed results. Some findings show that mentoring has positive outcomes for kids and other studies have shown that mentoring doesn't. The meta-analysis show that when you study all the, this, put all the studies together and you look at how big of an effect do, does mentoring have on youth outcomes, the general finding is that overall it has a small to moderate effect. It's not a very convincing thing to, to say, but that's not the whole story. If you look at the programs and you divide them into those that have okay uh, implementation of a model and those that really have good implementation of the model, what you find is better implemented programs have a moderate to large effect, sometimes a very large effect size. So 
making your programs stronger, implementing them is key to really being able to uh, make a difference for the young people that we are serving. So one of the things that I would say, the first key component is define what your outcomes are. Mentoring can have an effect on a lot of different things. And sometimes mentoring programs think kind of globally and they don't really define, this is the outcome that I want to change. You need to find it and you need to measure it, right? Measure it. And, um, you know, when you go to measure it, there are different ways that you can do it. Sometimes people think, well, we can just, you know, we're going to ask questions. So we, they sit down, they come up with the questions that they think would be the qu best questions to answer uh, or to ask. And that's not really the best strategy. There are, if you're measuring any of these outcomes, you can go and you can find uh, tools that have been researched and proven to be very good in terms of their psychometric properties that you know all of us we think we know how to ask a question but the truth is um, sometimes we we are not so good at asking questions and so the questions end up being um, maybe biased or they are vague and not clear or use terms that the people we're asking the questions of don't know don't understand so it's always better to rely on tools that exist out there. And through the National Mentoring Resource Center, there is a variety of tools that are available free to programs to have access to. So uh, don't just make up the questions. Identify what your program outcomes are, measure them, and use solid tools to do that. The second thing I would say is figure out what it is about your program that you expect to make a change and measure it. So I call these change agents, right? For most mentoring programs, we think of the mentoring relationship as being the key change agent. So how do we measure? Is it the number of days or months between intake and discharge? That might tell you something. Uh, but anyone who's implemented programs knows there are a lot of other things that determine uh, how long that period is. The hours they spend together, or you could uh, ask them a few questions about the quality of the relationship. And again, at the NMRC, there are tools that you can get that will help you measure the quality of the relationship. And they're free for you to use. So. Uh, Second point, identify your change agent and, and measure it. If it's the relationship, then measure the relationship, the quality of the relationship. The second thing is that if you have tools that, or a curriculum that you are implementing, that's part of being a good quality program is to give your mentors those tools, all right? You can, you can measure the use of those tools and find out if using those tools is really making a difference in the quality of your kids. The third thing I would say is make a comparison, all right? Uh, we, we often think about comparing how kids are when they enter our program to when they leave our program. You might wanna consider um, certain intervals of time, like at three months, six months in discharge, so that you have nice standard periods of time that you can compare um, the outcomes to. Uh, you, can, you can look at different groups within your programs. Youth who complete the program, youth that drop out, those that have relationships that last six months or more, uh, mentors and mentees, do they come from the same cultural backgrounds or different cultural backgrounds? You can look at demographic characteristics, but making those comparisons, think of how powerful uh, your uh, evaluation and that use of data can be if you start using it to make, uh, to, to look at what those differences are among groups. The third thing I would say or the fourth thing I would say is include the youth and family voice. A lot of times uh, social service providers, 
they they focus on what the staff are doing but young people that you're serving and their families they have good information about how they are receiving the services that you're providing so think about having advisory boards think about doing regular surveys or focus groups with them provide uh, ways that they can help you collect the data you know having a young people having a young person talk to other mentees to get information can be really powerful and maybe you get better data data about what the experience is uh, if you can figure out a way to do that it's good and get their feedback on if you're going to write a report about your program try to get their feedback on what you're uh, what you're writing what you're finding okay include the youth and family voice very important and the last thing I would say is integrate program evaluation into your program activities. You every day you're doing work, you're creating data that you can use. You have administrative data that can tell you something important. If you have staff collect doing intake interviews, asking questions, there are teach them how to ask questions, teach them how to collect that data so that it's good data and complete the forms so that you have all of the information. You know, have procedures for what I call cleaning. Every time you, you, you use and collect data, people make typos, people make errors, things are left out. Take a little bit of time, staff time periodically to look at the data and, and make sure it's clean and and then regularly do that analysis and talk about it with your staff and with the families and youth that you serve. It sounds like a lot, but it's really not that hard. And what you're going to find today as as Anne and Damian speak, you're going to find out how to do it in ways that will really empower your programs. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Anne. And Anne, as uh, well, before I do that, I want to say one more thing. And that is through the NM NMRC, you can get free technical assistance. And uh, there is a way that you can apply for that. It's up to 30 hours. And um, I'd be glad to help you. Uh, my contact information is readily available on our website at the end of this presentation. I can help you fill out the application to get that kind of, of assistance and we can help you implement um, program evaluation that meets your needs and tailored to what you need. So, and help you navigate all of those tools if you like, okay? And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Anne who's gonna tell you um, a little bit more about re results-based accountability. Just tell me when you want me to flip, okay? Okay, I'm ready. Hi everybody, my name is Ann mcintyre Loner, and like Joe said, um, I work with results-based accountability. I started out as a private nonprofit provider for quite a few years. Then I worked for a couple of large state agencies for many more years. And for the past few years, I have been running action to outcomes, helping people work with data to achieve outcomes for their clients. Next slide, please. And speaking of outcomes, we're going to do a really brief introduction to results-based accountability today. I'm going to run through the major concepts with you um, and hopefully give you a sense of what you can achieve by using an approach like RBA. So we use results-based accountability to focus on results or outcomes for people. And we do that in two ways, at the population level and at the performance level. Now, when I'm talking about population, I'm not talking about your client population. I'm not talking about the population served by your agency. And I'm not talking about clients in general. When we talk about population level work, we talk about a geographic area, and then a group of people, all people within that geographic area. Some examples might be all school-aged children in Connecticut, all families in Hartford, or all senior citizens in Waterbury. 
So when we talk about population level work, again, we're talking about a big group of people. We're not talking about programs. We're not talking about services. And today, we're not talking about population level work. It's important to understand the difference between the two, but today we're going to focus on performance level work. And performance level work is about the work done by service systems and agencies and programs. And we focus on how using data and improving our performance can lead to better results for our clients. Next slide, please. So there are three kinds of performance measures that we're gonna talk about. Joe, can, I think this slide has a couple more clicks on it. So if you can, yeah, and one more, I believe. So we're gonna really focus on the bottom of the slide. So with results-based accountability, we're going to measure the amount of work we do, the quality of that work, and whether it leads to client outcomes. And we do that by asking three questions. How much did we do? That's the quantity of our work. How well did we do it to get to the quality of our work? And then is anyone better off? And that's all about our client outcomes. Next slide, please. We're gonna start by really focusing on outcomes. I like to say, start with the end in mind. And the reason why that is so important is by focusing on the outcome, it keeps us with our eye on the prize really making sure that all of our efforts are aligned to improving outcomes for our clients. As my colleague, um, Dan Rockwell says, hitting the bullseye on the wrong target is still failure. You did all the right, uh, well, you did all the right things, but you were aiming at the wrong outcome. So you did a really good job on something else. So we wanna stay focused on that outcome that you're trying to achieve. Next slide, please, Joe. So let's, so starting with the end in mind, let's talk about designing performance measures um, at, at, for your program. Now, I realize that most of you who are watching this are probably knee deep in the middle of a mentoring program. And so even though you're starting at the middle, um, that's really fine. What I'm going to ask you to do is take all that work that you do just for a couple minutes and put it to the side. Think about the outcome. And instead of focusing on all that work that you do and then talking about how to measure it, we're going to focus on what it is you're trying to achieve, how you're going to measure that. And then you start thinking about all the different things you need to do to achieve that outcome. And I'm gonna tell you, after many years of doing this kind of work, my colleagues and I have often found that when we're in the middle of a program and we implement RBA, we find that some of that business as usual, some of the things that we've been doing actually do not lead us to the outcome we're trying to get. And that prompts us to consider making some changes in the program. Next slide, please, Joe. So now let's talk about those three different kinds of performance measures I've been hinting at. How much did we do? This is about you and your coworkers and the, the amount of work you did. We're not analyzing it. We're not talking about the quality. We're not talking about, does it lead to an outcome? We just wanna measure what it is you're doing. When we talk about the quality of your work, how well did we do it? This is also about you and your colleagues and your work. We finally get to the most important question, is anyone better off? That's not about you. That's about your clients and whether or not they benefited from the work that you did. Next slide, please, Joe. When we talk about the quantity of our work, we're really trying to get at, what did I do? Did I do all the things that I were supposed to do? And did I do enough of them? So it's about the quantity of work provided or the quantity of service delivered. Some examples of that might be the number of clients you served, the number of mentors you were able to successfully recruit, and the number of matches that you created. It's all about quantity. Next slide, please. When we talk about the quality of the program, now you're asking yourself about how well you actually delivered those services or did that work. It's about you and the quality of what you're providing. Some examples might be 
the percent of clients who actually completed the program, how long it took to get from an initial referral to making a match, or the percent of mentors and mentees who feel respected by you and your coworkers. Next slide, please. When we get to, is anyone better off? Now we're talking about our clients and we wanna know, are they better off as a result of going through your program? It's about them. And we measure that in four different ways. We can talk about a change in their skills or their knowledge, usually after a training or an education program. We can talk about changes in attitude, measure changes in behavior, and also measure changes in client circumstance. Next slide, please. Some examples of that would be, um, can, next slide, please, Joe. Or you're clicking away and your, your mouse is going slowly. So some examples of that might be the percent of clients who increase their subject matter knowledge after going through a training or an education program. The percent of clients who have stable and affordable housing after going through a housing assistance program. More specifically to mentoring, we can look at the percent of mentees who report in their changes about feelings of hope for their future. The percent of mentees who actually have improved school attendance or the percent of mentees who either graduated, if that was appropriate, or were promoted to the next grade level. Next slide, please. And Joe, can you click for me one time, one more time on this slide? There's this missing little middle section here um, that likes to hide. So when we, when we talk about, and don't if it won't come up, don't worry. When we talk about how to use performance measures, it's really important to understand that the most important thing that we're doing when we create and use performance measures is figuring out how to improve performance. Number two that's refusing to show up on the slide here would tell us avoid punishment, right? Avoid the performance punishment trap. We're not using performance data to punish anyone. We're using it to learn what are those things that we're doing really well that we want to celebrate? And where are those areas that we either need to spend a little more time, work a little harder, or in some cases even change our approach? But it's all about understanding what we're doing well and where we need to maybe change our approach. Next slide, please. The next important thing to think about when we're using performance data is to make sure we put it in context. And we do that by telling the story. We tell the story behind the data or also known as telling the story behind the baseline. And I like to call this the good, the bad, and the ugly. Because you wanna be able to talk about what are those positive forces that helped our program? Maybe the governor put out a press release talking about how great mentoring is in helping young people reach their potential. Some of the bad might be, well, gosh, we're in the middle of a global pandemic and it's really hard to recruit mentors right now. It's not a rehash of your data. Don't explain a data chart. Tell us what's going on that influenced why you got the, the performance data that you got. Help, help your audience understand what was really going on. Next slide, please. And the next thing I wanna tell you is the importance of using trend data. If I look at point in time data about my program today, it tells me how my program is doing today, but not compared to how it was doing last week, last month, or last year. In some ways, it's kind of like opening the newspaper to look at how the stock market is doing. You'll find out how it's doing today. But if you're someone who invests in the stock market, or maybe like me, you'd like to be able to invest in the stock market someday, it doesn't tell you if the stocks you're interested in are doing well and going up, or maybe not so hard, hot and going down. Trend data tells us are we doing really well and maintaining high performance over time? Have we actually taken performance that wasn't so great and been able to improve it over time? Or conversely, are we having some challenges and maybe not doing so hot and we need to pay attention 
to where our performance is going. Next slide, please. So what does all that have to do with managing and marketing and evaluating your program? Well, by creating performance measures and then using the performance data over time, you can understand how much you're doing and how well you're doing. And you can help your funders and people who are interested in your program understand that too. Even more important, you can understand, are you making a difference? Are your clients actually better off after having gone through your program? And that's something you really want your funders to be able to understand, right? You wanna let them know, are you able to help someone change their attitude opinion or opinion, their skills or knowledge, their behaviors or their circumstances? Next slide, please. And, and when that's not happening for you, you wanna know ahead of time so you can start working on those areas where you need to improve. So Joe was talking before about a well-run mentoring program, a mentoring relationship can create change. You can show, and you wanna show the change that you've been able to create by sharing your performance data. You wanna share pre-program data and post-participation uh, post data as well. And remember, use those stories to show the good, the bad, and the ugly. Now, I've had a chance to look at Damien's slides. And what I'd invite you to do as he takes over the presentation right after me is pay attention to how Damien uses that good data to, to tell the story about his program and help people understand what the program is achieving. And look at how he uses stories to bring it alive and to make it real. Next slide, please. This is my last slide. If this brief introduction intrigued you, if you have some more questions, if you wanna see how maybe I can help your agency, this is my contact information and you are most welcome to reach out to me. And at that point, I'm going to turn it over to Damien to, um, to talk about his mentoring program in particular. Good afternoon. Joe, if you can go one slide back for me. Skip oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Uh, so thanks, Anne. Uh, and I'm Damien Grasso. I am a clinical psychologist and associate professor at UConn. Um, mostly I uh, do research and clinical work uh, for my day job, but a very important side project of mine is the uh, Connecticut Youth Excellence Project, or YEP for short, uh, which is an entirely uh, volunteer-run program I started in 2014. Um, that combines outdoor experiences with adult and peer mentorship uh, for male youth who are ages 13 to 16. Uh, originally, uh, I designed the program to serve uh, youth in foster care, but since 2014, I've expanded it to include uh, youth who are adopted from child welfare, as well as uh, other youth who have faced significant life challenges like trauma, maltreatment, adversity, or loss. Uh, a number of kids in the program have stress-related mental health problems like PTSD and depression or anxiety. Uh, many uh, are also receiving um, office-based therapy. My overall goal for the program is to capitalize on the healing properties of, of being in natural outdoor spaces, as well as uh, mentoring relationships to, to promote resilience and foster uh, personal growth in these youth. So each year uh, we have a cohort of about 10 to 12 youths um, who participate uh, in monthly activities that include hiking, camping, paddling, rock climbing, and other things. Um, and these overnights culminate in a longer expedition uh, that we take in the summer. Uh, over the past few years, these have been on the East Coast uh, in Maine and Pennsylvania, New Hampshire. In other years, uh, with when, um, where I, when I had some more funding, uh, we actually went out to California to go to the Channel Islands National Park, uh, as well as Yosemite. Uh, you can, uh, next slide, please. As a volunteer program, we operate mainly through a, a handful of volunteers I have. Um, however, uh, there are costs associated with the services provided by expert guides and, and outfitters. 
Um, for the past year, actually, a few years, actually, we've worked closely with another nonprofit in Connecticut called Outside Perspectives, uh, which really focuses on connecting youth with the outdoors. Um, depending on our activities and, and where we go, our budget each year uh, ranges from about twenty to forty thousand um, dollars. This year might be tighter than that even. Uh, most of this comes from small foundation grants and donors. And to achieve this, uh, we need to be very clear about why this program is valuable and why it's worth investing in. And so as Anne discussed, this means um, that I need to show that uh, we're doing what we're setting, setting out to do, um, serving uh, this number of youth. It's a small program, but um, my, my goal is to engage 10 to 12 youths that we're doing it well and that we're facilitating meaningful change in the youth that we serve. Um, so although uh, each of the youth benefits, I think in unique ways, I see seven uh, core objectives um, of the program. And you can see those there uh, to establish meaningful and sustainable relationships with adult mentors and peers. I think that's for me the most important and what really drove my uh, initiating this program. Uh, to help youth develop life strategies, uh, to help youth learn about and embrace healthy lifestyle habits, to learn about the impact of stress um, and adopt healthy coping uh, strategies, to increase youth self-confidence and self-efficacy, uh, to help youth to identify and connect with uh, community resources, and to gain practical life skills. A lot of what we do uh, with these youth is translatable uh, in, their, in their lives. Next slide, please. So uh, with these objectives established, uh, our next task is to determine how can we effectively measure them. Uh, and so here you can see I, I broke up my objectives into several key constructs that we can measure in a number of ways. So you can see the constructs there, relationship quality, uh, perceived social support with peers and adults, uh, goal setting behavior, uh, coping strategies, self-confidence, life skills. Uh, and we can measure these in a number of ways um, with several different sources, starting with youth self-report. Uh, we can get a report from a caregiver or a caseworker or therapist or other person in the youth's life, uh, or we can get this information through observation. We can also measure these things using a variety of tools or methods uh, that include the use of questionnaires or surveys, um, as Anne discussed, these can be administered over time to look at trends. These can be administered at one time point, of course. Um, we can also take a qualitative approach to conceptualizing and communicating uh, individual youth experiences and change and uh, optimally really combine uh, that empirical data with the qualitative data to tell a meaningful story. Next slide. Um, here are some examples of, of data I collected at baseline in a year after my program um, that show trends on several of the constructs related to my objectives. Uh, when you do this, uh, you want to keep the data simple. Here I'm using bar charts to show uh, that there were reductions in emotional and behavioral problems and increases in uh, social and personal skills, perceived social support and coping strategies. Uh, and to collect these data, I used a, a validated measure called the, the Strengths and Difficulties Questionnaire. And as, as Joe mentioned, when possible, even though our goal uh, with these programs was not to conduct research or, or, to, um, or to perform a clinical assessment, you should strive to use validated tools that, that have been tested and that have been shown to measure what they're designed to measure. Uh, next slide, please. Sometimes uh, there won't be a validated measure uh, and you might need to rely on, on what we might consider a home cook survey and that's okay. Uh, the data here represent uh, responses on a, a post-program only survey that I created uh, to get at youth satisfaction and perceptions of change on different constructs. Here too, uh, keeping it really simple and just providing the percentage of youth who endorsed uh, each of these I'm not going to read them all here, but just, you know, 87% said they, they noticed improvements in, in health behaviors. 92% uh, um, noticed increases in the way they cope with stress. 100% uh, endorsed having um, more social support. Uh, like I said, many of the youth have been exposed to trauma and have PTSD. 
about 40% said um, that they've really, uh, they, they've been able to process some of that trauma um, and, and feel like they've recovered from that uh, to some degree. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the most powerful tool, I think, for communicating the effectiveness of my program has been observing these youth throughout the year and organizing these observations into a, a compelling narrative. Um, when I do this, uh, you know, I keep these brief and uh, aim to highlight the before and after, how uh, the youth have benefited from the program. Sometimes there's a specific experience that stands out as particularly compelling, uh, which I try to capture. So I just, it's up here on the screen, but I'll just paraphrase. So Kyle, he's 16 with an extensive history of exposure to domestic violence and, and emotional physical abuse. Uh, he was new to the program. Uh, many of the kids looked up to Kyle because he was athletic and had natural leadership skills. Uh, Yep gave Kyle an outlet for further developing these skills. He also showed a willingness to share his past experiences and current struggle with post-traumatic stress disorder. On one of our campouts, uh, he shared with the group um, his experiences of physical abuse and the challenges he currently faces. Um, he went on to explain uh, to the others that he, re he recently started uh, trauma-focused therapy to work on some of these problems related to the abuse. He shared that while he was, he's nervous about it, he's hopeful that the therapy will make a different difference for him and he's willing to give it a shot. Kyle sharing his experiences and involvement in therapy was monumental in terms of destigmatizing psychological treatment and motivating his peers to consider engaging in this work. After he explained this uh, on that camp out, several other youth actually opened up about their own experiences. And uh, it was truly uh, for me a moment to applaud the work that we're doing uh, with these youth. Next slide, please. Here is another one, uh, Calvin, he's 14 with a history of physical abuse and abandonment. Uh, he also came in actively dealing with symptoms of traumatic stress related to his experiences on several occasions needed support from an adult mentor uh, to work through some of these episodes. Uh, several of our youth do struggle with, with trauma related problems or have been diagnosed with PTSD. Uh, experiences in which youth are removed from you know, their typical, often technology dependent and sometimes chaotic lifestyle can promote a, a new awareness of oneself in one environment. It also frees the mind to explore memories or feelings that have been maybe purposely avoided uh, such as trauma. And while this can be discomforting and, and painful, with guidance and support, these youth can make significant strides in recovery and personal growth. Kelvin took this opportunity uh, to process some of his experiences of, and loss. He learned to recognize when he might need extra support and called upon an adult mentor to take a walk with him or ensure he had some personal space uh, to work through it. Uh, he also made uh, tremendous progress throughout the year According to his caregivers, um, he he showed progress that he had that that hadn't been observed in the context of his traditional office-based therapy. This isn't a replacement for office-based therapy, but it can be a complement. And I think that for me, that um, you know that uh, that feedback was uh, especially rewarding. Next slide, please. Um, I'm going to skip these uh, just for time, but uh, you know, I, I normally um, on my reports and on some of the grant applications, um, you know, do include about four of these uh, these different bios. Another thing you can do is ask youth to share, in their own words, uh, their perspective of the program. In this statement, Chris is highlighting how being in nature has helped him to sort out his feelings and learn to cope with difficult things that have happened to him. He also is expressing how Yep has been like a family to him and how uh, he has met one of his uh, key role models uh, through this program. Next slide, please. And in this statement, Eric expresses how the program had challenged him and that by the end of the extended day trip, after having, I believe this was after Yosemite, a lot of backpacking, um, after having to go without technology and sometimes having to tolerate discomfort or strain, uh, he came out stronger. He also talked about how important it was for him to form relationships with his peers and the adults in the program. Uh, statements like these um, from youth can be hugely instrumental 
in communicating the value of the program. And for me personally, uh, reading these again serve as reminders of why, why I'm doing this program and why it's so important. Um, I didn't share this in the stories I put up for you here, but I have also included stories of youth who I've kept in touch with over the years. Uh, since building sustainable relationships is a key objective, it helps to reflect in how these youth have remained connected with me and other adult mentors. Um, I have one youth who, who serves in the army and who I regularly talk to and see when he visits. I have another youth who's actually returning this year to be an adult leader in the program. Um, so uh, I, I do definitely highlight these. Also, uh, pictures help. All the pictures I showed today um, are from our program. Uh, these tell their own story and are, are much more telling than stock photos. Uh, so if, if it's possible to get a release to collect pictures, um, that uh, do so. All right, uh, last slide, just to say that if you know of a youth who resides in Connecticut who might benefit from my program, contact me. I am having an orientation in about a week and a half. Um, or if you have other questions or, or comments or, or know of uh, any way to support the program, uh, please be in touch. Thanks. Okay, that um, sounds wonderful. It, it's a, it sounds like a wonderful program. And I think between the two of you, we've really gotten uh, a good grounding in terms of um, how to do how to do some program evaluation. We only have a few minutes left, but I would like to ask uh, if anyone wants to unmute themselves and ask a question, they can feel free to do so right now. Uh, we, we can take one or two questions. because right now I can't see the chat. If people have put things in the chat, I'm not able to see. Well, I can see the chat. I'll respond if there's any. Okay. Thank you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna respond to Wendy Ladd's comment. Thank you, Wendy. STEPS is an amazing program. Glad to see you in the audience. <laughs> Well, because we're running for time, if there aren't um, any comments, I know it's a lot of information and it's, it's only the beginning. Uh, there's so much more when you're trying to put together an evaluation of your program. And so you have uh, some really good resources here. Uh, you can uh, contact me if you'd like to find out about the resources through the NMRC or you can contact Anne if you uh, are intrigued by the results-based accountability approach. It's a very solid approach. And uh, certainly if you have young people who could benefit from the YEP program, uh, definitely contact Damien. I think that his, uh, his example of his program really highlighted you know, that how important that story is that, that you use to promote your program. Uh, and the use of it. So thank you both. I want to, uh, before we leave, I want to remind you that we're not done for today. There is another session coming up. It's on emerging technology for mentoring programs. It's about using apps. It's about using games uh, that uh, we can use virtual mentoring. Right now for many mentoring programs, that's what's available. And so we're struggling to try and figure out how to make that virtual experience really engaging for mentor and men mentors and mentees. So I think that uh, this session will both give you the heads up on some really cool tools that are coming out in the next few years, as well as some games and activities that you can do with uh, your mentors and mentees now. And tomorrow we're gonna have a fantastic day also. We're gonna have doctors um, Jean Rhodes and Tori Weston Sudan speaking about um, social equity and opportunities that we have in mentoring now, as well as some of the challenges. So I really uh, look forward to seeing you both later today and tomorrow. And I want to take a minute to say thank you to Anne and to Damien for this very interesting presentation. And with that, I'm going to uh, let you go. If you need to contact me, 
This is my information. I, you can find it on the website at the Governor's Prevention Partnership staff page, but it's my name, Joe Hawk at preventionworksct.org. Okay, take care. Have a, a wonderful rest of your afternoon and we'll see you on Zoom. Bye-bye.